no, indeed. So, Internet's Darkest Corners. I mean, there's some dark places on the Internet. I mean, we... It's we, really a part of the Internet called the Dark Web. Yeah. Hopefully this it, isn't talking about that, because it's like it's real dark. Too dark, mm -hmm. in certain regards. But, yeah, like I was saying, dude, this whole deal with, uh, with you know, the Internet having some pretty dark corners... And some very, like, Mr. Swirl is, to me, still probably one of the more messed up stories. The fact that that dude is out. He's out and about right now. And there's no, and, the, and there's no way they can, and there's no way they've been able to stop him. And then Schoolboy, the last one that we had, uh, the last one we watched. Mm -hmm. That one's supremely messed up. But, yeah, I, I don't know the the internet's darkest corners are filled with some very, very bad things. And we're going to watch a few of them. And uh, we're going to see what we think. Uh, so, anyway. The one and only Nick Crowley is going to be guiding us through this. And uh, I guess we're going to hopefully not get too depressed by watch while watching this. Are you ready? I hope so. Let's go. Oh. Is that blue box on the screen? Oh, that. Uh, that's uh, that's the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, it's just I have it turned off right now, so you can't see it. It's 3:16 p.m. on April 10th, 2018. A 911 operator receives a call from 16-year-old Kyle Plush, who had just experienced a freak accident. In the minutes prior to this call, Kyle had just arrived at the Seven Hill School in Cincinnati, Ohio for a tennis match. He had been driving a 2004 Honda Odyssey, a minivan that featured three rows of seating, with his gear for the day's match did being not stored look in 16. the very No, he didn't. Back. In order to retrieve it, Kyle climbed to the back of the vehicle and reached over the third row seating, extending his body as far as it could go in order to grab his equipment, when suddenly, the seat's folding mechanism was oh, engaged, shit. causing it to collapse into its storage position, taking Kyle with it. In an instant, he was pinned and completely unable to move as he was now trapped in the car upside down, not even being able to move his arms and hands enough to grab his cell phone. Though luckily, his phone had Siri, which he would call out to to call the police. While on the phone, Kyle couldn't... Here's the thing that they always tell you in emergency situations. Uh, if you have a CB radio and there's no, like, you're not hearing anything, like, being responded to, they always tell you, like, every now and again, relay your position. Like, relay your position, give out landmarks, like, buildings, like, wherever you're at. Uh, like, because... You never know who's listening, and that may very well save your life. And in this, in the, this kid, if I were him, I would literally just be like, I would just be like, uh, he, like, my name is, my name is Kyle. I'm stuck in the back of a van. I, uh, I'm at this address here. It's a gold van. Uh, if you could hear me, please send help. Like. But he's panicking right now, so he doesn't really have the forethought to do that. Didn't hear anything. Trying to think straight when you're upside down, too. But he stayed yeah. as clear Blood as he could. Blood under your head and making you dizzy and shit. Yeah. That he was in dire need of help. Due to the position he was stuck in, he was already struggling to breathe, yeah, and he knew he was sure likely not going to survive much longer. Yeah. Here's the thing with stuff like that. I'm glad that they don't do that anymore, and they don't fold back like that. Instead, they like pull back and fold forward and and do that and oh which he made very clear to the operator less than one minute later the call would cut out 
In the recording, Kyle clearly portrayed to the operator where he was, that he couldn't hear her, and that his life was in danger, which prompted her to immediately send a patrol car over to the school in search of him. Though inexplicably, she never told the officers that Kyle believed he was going to die. Not understanding how dire the situation was, the officers that pulled up to the scene didn't even bother to stop the car. Instead, they simply drove throughout the parking lot, unsure of what car was oh my God. They didn't even Come bother on. to turn down their music or crack a window. Seemingly being more interested in the types of cars that other students were driving. As officers continued their half-hearted search, another phone call would be made to 911. It was Kyle, whose tone was now drastically different. I probably don't have much time left to tell my mom that I love her if I die. This is not exactly the way I want to end it. I don't want to end it any other way. After Kyle says his goodbyes, he tries Damn. one more time to relay what was happening, this time providing the parking lot he was in, along with the exact make and model of his car. This is not a joke. I'm trapped inside my gold Honda Odyssey van in the software parking lot of Seven Hills, Hills Beth. Send officers immediately. I'm almost dead. At this point, officers were still in the parking lot looking for him. Help was literally just a few feet away. And on top of this, the operator was also able to get a ping from Kyle's phone, which gave coordinates to his exact location, within just 5 to 10 feet of his vehicle. And yet, the dispatcher never passed this information along. What Why? The fuck? Why? Okay, here's the thing. I know that there's instances where people can... Where, where people call in and fake shit all the time. People, like, crank call, 911, and all that, yeah. Or, you know, swatting incidences and stuff like that, yeah, I get it. This is just infuriating. This is different, man. Like, it, it, if... I don't care if, like, you cause damage to a person's vehicle because of a joke or something like that. Like, in all, in all seriousness, you must be willing to, to do what is necessary to save someone's life. Um. As Kyle remained on the line fighting for his life, the officers on the scene would pull out of the parking lot, close their report, and carry on with their day, stating, I don't see nobody, which I didn't imagine I would. With this line making it apparent that those involved with the case never actually believed this situation was real, and instead viewed it all as a hoax. Rest in peace, kid. Just minutes later, Kyle would go quiet, and the phone would disconnect for a final time. It would take six hours for that trunk to be opened, and not by the police, but instead by Kyle's father, who had no idea that any of this had taken oh place, seeking out his son's vehicle, only to find Kyle flipped upside down in the trunk. He had been dead for hours. Despite the circumstances, Kyle did everything right. He remained calm, he was respectful, and he described exactly where he was and what his car looked like. And yet, the police never really bothered to take his case seriously, instead believing that this was all just a prank. And had the dispatcher simply relayed how serious the situation was, and had these officers just gotten out of their car to look more thoroughly, Kyle Plush most likely would have survived. As a result of the mishandling of Kyle's case, his parents, Jill and Ron, were awarded a $6 million settlement with the city of Cincinnati. It's not gonna bring him back, though. Their little boy is dead. Their little boy is gone, and, and he is never coming back. And the fact that the police just... Look, I'm not gonna act like I know, like, everything that the police go through. You know, they witness, pay witness to some horrible, horrible shit. But... There's there are situations where you have to where you have to take things seriously. You have to. It's your job as officers of, uh, as peace officers and or in order to protect and serve. This kid should still be alive right now, dude. This kid should still be alive 
and he should be like off at a tennis match or or like in college somewhere. Anything, dude. It's just ridiculous. Though even more importantly for the couple, they vowed to do their part to assure that mishandled 911 calls of this nature never happen again, as they've gone on to consult with various emergency call centers to tell Kyle's story, somehow taking this horrible accident and selflessly turning it into something positive for the rest of society. Today, these phone calls remain relics of a grave error made by law enforcement and a life that never should have been lost. I only know one 911 operator and she's amazing. Everybody needs to be like her if they're going to work that kind of job. Yeah. Now being forever immortalized so you know in the internet. She's literally called you in emergency situations. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a friend who has seizures, so we've sent people to check on him. Yes. And she's gotten people sent to check on him before whenever it's gone down and stuff, and she doesn't even live in the same state as him, so. Yeah. I remember when we were like desperately trying to look for any information that we could to send help to him, and yeah, it, that was that was a scary time. Internet's mm -hmm. darkest corners. This clearly shows the metamorphosis is possible using computer graphics. We got to play a game. Is it hide and seek? Yes, it's hide and seek. Oh, it's big and devastating. Fresh tobacco for this. Yeah. <laughs> uh. It's April 4th, 2020. Yes, a man living in Baltimore, to Maryland go to goes house, live yeah. on his. They haven't. Uh, they, uh, they're still staying at uh, his sister's house until the power comes back on. I'm also assuming that bridge will have to be fixed. Probably. Uh, any I, other way I think. Around, well, so. there's multiple ways to their house. Mm. There's multiple ways in. It's just that bridge is like the most prominent way. Yeah. I mean, we. I mean, we've taken like, we've taken like multiple routes to get to Lee and Megan's house, and it's it's easy enough to get there. Fair enough. His Facebook page announcing that tonight would be Damn another it. one of his famous game nights. Oh, At this time, the COVID lockdown was in place all across the United States, and practically everyone was cooped up indoors, with little opportunity for real socialization. But for 24-year-old Ernest Wilson and his friends, this didn't stop them from having a good time. Ernest often hosted parties featuring childhood games like Monopoly and Uno, adding in his adult flair by turning them into drinking games, with one game in particular being top of mind that night. Hide and Seek. The evening began with Ernest inviting his Facebook friends to the function, letting them know that this time the game night would be held at an Airbnb rather than in his home, though he never gave out the address as this was a closed invitation event, which he made very clear on his page. Please don't show up with nobody I didn't personally invite if we didn't discuss it first. They're going to get left outside. Ernest took this so seriously that at one point he even called out one of his viewers, stating outright that they were not allowed to show up under any circumstances. You're not invited. You're not pulling up on me. The person who just joined. If you're still watching, you're not invited. Because you don't fucking listen and I'm gonna bang you in your mouth next time. However, it was never revealed who exactly this person was, or why Ernest expressed such hostility towards them. From there, Ernest would start and stop like his live stream he knew. a few different times. Probably. It's probably someone that... Or at least that... somebody he's had problems with on his streams <sighs> in the past. Probably. Following the progression of the party, which ended up with a decent turnout. <laughs> And by 2 a.m., with there being no signs of slowing down, it was time for the main event. About to play hide and seek. This was the caption for Ernest's final live stream of the night, which shows his group of friends preparing to play the game, turning off all the lights in the house before Ernest himself steps outside, assuming the role of the seeker, beginning his countdown as the camera keeps rolling. Two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I can hear y'all. Fourteen, fifteen. I can see y'all. Sixteen, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Cause I'm tired of fucking counting. Ready or not, here I come. After a long 30 seconds, it was time to find his friends, with Ernest starting a search inside the home. Ain't nobody in this bathroom. I didn't think about it. Fuck. Oh, all right. His ass. He didn't lock the door behind him when he came back in, did he? I don't think so. Until he notices something. Next time they want y'all ass. Down here. Ah, the front door locked. I'm on your ass. According to Ernest, someone was trying to get in through the front door, unaware that he had just locked it. Oh. And assuming that this was one of the people he was looking for, he took off to the backyard, believing that's where he would find them. And sure enough, he did. One, two, three. Who the f is that, G? I don't know. Get your, okay, get your dumb on the other side of this gate. Who the fuck? Uh, Ernest flips the camera around, revealing a man hopping over a gate to the backyard. He had no idea who this person was, but he seemed to assume that they were likely just trying to get into the party, not really taking it too seriously, hence his joking attitude. Though his attitude would soon shift drastically. Dumbass nigga, this can't be one of my friends. Oh shit. <laughs> hey, Pod! Put that shit on! In this moment, Ernest's live stream cuts off, and he would never go live again. Oh, crap. According to those at the party, this unknown man hopped the fence and brandished a gun, stating that he was there to rob the place, being followed by one other person whom the group also failed to recognize. Ernest tried his best to run, but was eventually caught in the house, where after a few minutes, and for reasons unknown, the man seen hopping the fence fired his weapon, striking Ernest twice and ending his life. The killers quickly fled the scene without harming anyone else, or seemingly without even taking anything. The footage is highly disturbing, knowing that we're witnessing the final moments of a man who was just having some fun with his friends. But what makes this so much darker is that we have no idea who this person is, or why they did what they did. Oh, Even after four and a half years, Ernest Wilson's killers have yet to be identified. Detectives working on the case have theorized that this was likely a robbery gone wrong, potentially spurred on by Ernest's posting habits, as to put it bluntly, he was a drug dealer, as on his Facebook page he often showed off huge amounts of his product, including during a live stream he did on the very day of this party. And also on the same day, Ernest had made a post about how much cash he had on him, essentially putting a target on his back. Online, some have theorized that- Once again, Frank Lucas evaded capture for so long because people did not know who the hell he was because he kept a low profile. Yeah, I'm not coming, I'm not trying to come off as victim blaming. Boy, it's never smart to just put stuff that you have like that up to the public. No, it isn't. And here's the thing, I... I'm, I'm just saying be careful. Yeah, I, I'm, I try to be as careful as possible with what I post and everything and I try not to make, try not to make things more than what they need to be. I mean, by no means do I think that, like, like, I'm not telling you you can't, like, post whatever you want. Dude, if you want to show off, show off. But just know this. It's not just your fans who are watching. It's people with malicious intent, and if they know where you live, and they know where you're going to be, and they know that you're going to be alone, or you're not going to have, like, something to protect yourself... Then, or even if they know you're not going to be at home, like there you go, putting everything you own at risk. There you go. That this botched robbery may have been committed by the person that entered Ernest's live stream earlier that night, which caused him to have that intense so reaction. That's what I'm wondering about. You're not invited. You're not pulling up on me because you don't fucking listen. And I'm gonna bang you in your mouth next time. Though to my knowledge, this person has never actually been tracked down. But by far the most common sentiment online was that Ernest's friends were involved to some capacity, as none of them were injured and none of their possessions were taken, making it clear that at the very least this crime was targeted at the host. 
And on top of this, remember, Ernest never shared the address for that Airbnb, at least not publicly. Uh... And yet, these people just so happened to show up to the home at the exact moments that Ernest was by himself in the dark. Yeah. And perhaps most chillingly, as the robbery is unfolding, you can hear one of Ernest's friends chuckling in the background. This can't be one of my friends. Though as concerning as this is, it's sadly far from conclusive. And to this day, it appears that Ernest's case is slowly being lost to time, leaving us for now with only questions and one of the more disturbing live streams I've ever seen. And now, these messages. Before we dive into our next case, I want to first uh, thank today's video sponsor, Factor. Factor. I'll admit it, I have a very bad habit when it comes to ordering food. I usually don't give myself enough time to plan meals for the week, and therefore, when it comes time for dinner, I'm always left scrambling trying to find something, which usually leads to me ordering food and ordering really unhealthy food too. It's a bad habit, but thanks to Factor, I'm slowly starting to kick it. Factor provides chef-prepared, uh, ready-to-eat meals that are me. always fresh and never frozen. There's no stress, there's no prep work, just two minutes in the microwave and they're ready to go. And these meals really are restaurant quality and honestly, even more delicious than what I was ordering before anyway. Not to mention way healthier. But my favorite thing about Factor is the time I get back. As I'm not wasting my time and taking half an hour to figure out what I want to eat, it's all right there for I'm me. I'm not gonna lie, to go. that doesn't look the best. No. You just have to pick how many meals you want, and just like that, you have most, if not all, of your meals planned for the entire week. And you can even pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time with no stress. And what's really cool is Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, which just so happens to be uh, one of my favorite sponsors of all time. And now that mm. I'm eating real food, I'm excited to get back to cooking at some point with HelloFresh too. So definitely try either one of these out, or both, depending on what your situation is. If you want to try out Factor, head to factor75.com or click the no, link in the you. description and use code NickCrowley50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. That's code NickCrowley50 at Factor75.com to get 50% off your first box and 20% off your next month of orders. Hello Fresh bought Factor. As evidence, Does Hello Fresh still have their own thing too? Yes. Throughout the series. So they just Live run a monopoly on the food delivery thing? Online. I guess. And when researching Ernest's final stream, food I came across... I don't know. There's, there's several out there. Yet another example of just how dark things can get when the cameras go live. It happened on January 22nd, 2017, when a 14-year-old girl named Naika Venent went on Facebook Live with a caption. No, no. In the stream, Naika discussed how difficult life had been. Throughout the years, she had been placed in and out of countless foster homes, where her treatment ranged from poor to straight-up abusive with this constant mistreatment leading her to just want it to be over already. And based on the title of the stream, it was clear what her intentions were going to be. Damn. As the live stream progressed, hundreds of people flooded into the video to see what exactly was going on, as word quickly spread that something horrible was about to happen, though you wouldn't know it by looking at the chat. According to many watching, those in the comments had no sympathy for the girl, as many actually mocked her, calling her names, and even commented laughing emojis, as she desperately tried to open up with those same commenters viewing this not as a cry for help, but as a cry for attention, outright pushing her to carry on with these intentions. And tragically, she did, all while the camera remained rolling. Jesus However, Jesus. even after she followed through with this, the behavior of her chats didn't stop. Whether they assumed it was fake or just didn't care either way, the hateful barrage of insults actually got even more vile once she had obviously passed away. And this went past just words, as people who knew her actually began people? making parody videos of the girl, replicating the position she was dead in, all while her livestream continued running. It would take over an hour before police would finally be called and retrieve her body, with the stream being shut down by Facebook shortly before. It was an awful situation all around, but what I found most saddening about this was her final reason for doing what she did, as she stated simply that she just wanted to be with her real mother, who she loved so dearly. And this was something that seemed to be the plan all along, as her mother, Gina Alexis, claimed that she too desperately wanted to be reunited with her daughter. And following her daughter's highly publicized death, Gina actually came forward at a news conference to discuss the tragedy. Her biological mother broke down while speaking about her daughter's death. She dreamed of one day being reunited permanently. I have trust in Florida. Fuck the care, people, to care for my baby. 
where she blamed the entire foster care system for everything that had happened, believing that they didn't do a good enough job of keeping her daughter safe, and they failed to try and reunite her with Naika. Because of the obvious emotion involved and the overall shocking nature of this case, the news report would quickly go viral, leading to widespread support for the grieving mother. However, this also caused some people to look a bit deeper into what exactly led up to this livestream, for which one piece of information was brought to light that somehow made this case even more upsetting. On the day that Naika's life came to an end, it was revealed that her mother was actually in the stream watching before and after it happened, seeing her own daughter having this mental what? breakdown, as well as seeing all those people in the chat mocking her, which made people feel even more sorry for Gina as her plight was unimaginable. Though this wasn't the only revelation to come forward, as it was soon realized by the investigators looking into Naika's case that Gina had not only witnessed all of these people laughing at her daughter and egging her into ending her life, but she had also joined them as well. What the fuck? It's an evil world we live in, man. There's evil people out there, and... Mm. This, this is... Mm. Hashtag ADHD games play, you sad little DCF custody. That's why you are where you're at. For what? this dumb shit and more, you keep crying wolf. You dead, you will get buried, life goes on after it that doesn't listen to their parents, trying to be grown, seeking boys and girls' attention instead of her books. In a live stream, wow, one of the dude. last things Naika ever said was that she desperately wanted to be reunited with her mother. That same mother was not only watching, but actively pushing her to follow through on her plans, leaving this comment where she outright says that it doesn't matter if you live or die, life goes on. And it got even worse. The media also discovered that the reason Naika had been removed from her custody to begin with was because Gina had beaten her 30 plus times with a belt when she was only six years old. On top of this, Gina often texted Naika saying that she wanted nothing to do with her, despite the young girl frequently reaching out and begging to be part of her life. Eventually, Gina would tell Naika's caseworker that the girl is y'all's problem, I'm done with the games before sending Naika middle finger emojis when all she did was ask to see her brother. And this is all amongst other things that are far more horrendous that I really don't want to get into. And yet, after Naika's death, Gina had the audacity to go on television in an attempt to garner sympathy for a death that she clearly contributed to, saying that all she wanted was to be the girl's mother, despite rejecting her at every turn. And honestly, this is where I thought this entire story would come to an end, until I noticed something strange when I was editing this video. Naika's Facebook page is still active. What? It's no longer posting anything original, but instead, the account is consistently reposting content from another page, a page run by Gina. After Naika's death, you Gina seemingly seized bitch. control of the young girl's Facebook account. You evil fucking bitch. You are using your dead daughter's Facebook account for clout. You soulless bitch. Devil can't come for you quick enough, bitch. Devil cannot come quick enough for you. I swear to God. People like this make me sick. Oh my... Ugh. where she now posts her own content, which includes her attempting to defend the fact that she gave up on Naika. Tell me what mother would accept a 13 going on 14 year old in and out of detention centers, going to jail or getting arrested while in foster care. Hmm? As well as her responding to those who blamed her for her daughter's death. People be like, you heard the rumors going around And even some posts where she's promoting her podcast. As it seems that after all this, Gina's actually trying to carve out some sort of career as an influencer, as she posts videos garnering sympathy for the loss of her daughter, along with giving out parenting advice. I'm sorry, dude. Uh, like this, this is, this. 
this is evil. This is pure, unbridled evil. This woman... This woman... She deserves to be in prison. Yeah. I can imagine much worse for her, but... Yeah, that'll do. Like, there's so much stuff that parents need to do for their child. Shut the that fuck they're up, not motherfucking bitch. doing. Shut the they're fuck up. They're not paying up. attention because they're taking the easy way out. With all this making it even more obvious that Gina has little to no remorse for what she did. Fuck. On the 11th of June, 2009, yeah, a young man named that. Eugene Lata took to an urban exploration forum and wrote in broken English, Hello, I'd like to tell you about Odessa catacombs. Odessa is not far from the capital of Ukraine, Kiev. Under Odessa consists the biggest catacombs in the world. Their total length is more than 2,500 kilometers. So these catacombs the, are much uh, bigger French than the catacomb. Oh, wow. Paris catacombs. During World War II, a lot of citizens were hiding in the catacombs. A lot of them used to live there for a year and more. So even today, it is possible to find weapons, equipment, and even dead bodies. Every year, a lot of explorers get lost and even die there. His post was accompanied by a series of photographs from the underground labyrinth, which stretched over 1,500 miles, its paths winding aimlessly deep below the surface of the earth. The structure was mainly the result of limestone mining many years ago, though despite this, it was never properly mapped and was, conversely, not often explored, essentially being a pitch-black maze to nowhere. Given that the area wasn't well known back in 09, the post was met with amazement. Fellow urban explorers applauded the location and the photographs that Lata had taken, wanting to see even more. And since he was a native of the area, Lata delivered. Thanks to all. If you want, I can add more photos. As I said earlier, a lot of people get lost and even die under Odessa. Maybe this photo will shock you. It's Whoa. the dead body of a 19 year old girl who had gotten lost in the maze. Though it's censored here, the image shows three young boys staring blankly at the camera as they stand behind a badly decomposed body. Understandably, this image caused a lot of intrigue on the forum as other users began to press for more information. And sure enough, it was a story that Lata knew well. Three, two, one. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy 2005. It was New Year's Eve, the final day of 2004, when a group of teenagers made their way down into the catacombs to begin their celebration. This wasn't super uncommon at the time, as many of the entrances to this labyrinth were very easily accessible. This one in particular just so happened to be located directly next to the public school, School 56, and had just been left wide open, making it the perfect place oh for friends God. to sneak a few drinks. As the group began to grow more intoxicated, one of the girls wandered off in search of a place to relieve herself. However, she apparently took one too many turns and soon found herself completely alone. She cried out, but the tunnels were just too complicated. Each step she took led her more and more into obscurity. See, here's my thing with that. If I'm an urban explorer and there's something like that, I would do the red line system. You, you know about the red line system? Yeah, basically I would do that like a guideline system. Like, no matter, like, if you're going through all these tunnels... If you see a red line, grab onto it and follow it back to an exit. Like, that, to me, I think is, like, that should be number one. So that, even if someone does get lost down there... The only thing is, is I don't trust pieces of shit. Because what if someone fucks with your system while you're down in there? Well, I'd make it out of something that'd be hard to fuck with. Because that's the thing, is like... I mean, if someone sees your red line at the entrance, they can easily cut it. And then they can just move it wherever they want and fuck you over. Yeah. That's well, true. I'd probably be drawing a manual map myself very carefully. That's true, too. And that would have a compass on me as well. Yeah. So that at least if I started to get lost, I could try to continue going in a single direction until hopefully I can come across an exit. Yeah. Might also take supplies to potentially maybe blast or dig myself out if I had to. Yeah. It's like some sticks of dynamite, like, placed in the right spot, like, as a last-ditch effort. If you've been stuck for a good while, you could never know. You could blow yourself a hole. You yeah. Maybe climb out of. Or, yeah. There's <laughs> there's a lot that could happen, but yeah, I get what you're saying. You might flip somebody's Camry with your dynamite, not knowing you're under a street, but it's better than dying down there, yeah. you know? All of a sudden, you get up top and be like, 
you you fucked my car. And it's just like, I love that car, man. Why is someone trying to ruin my life? I'm sorry. I was trying to save mine, man. Holy I shit. There's li- a guy down there. It's like, it's like, sorry. I've been down here for three days. Can you give me some water, please? Agua, por favor. Her friends tried to find her, or maybe they didn't. We really don't know. But in their drunken state, they left the tunnels without their friend and never went back to find her. If she did have a flashlight, it wouldn't have lasted long, and for days she likely wandered deliriously through that pitch black maze. Until after what was likely at least three awful days, the other thing is if she you're passed away. Really by yourself and you just went away. Like, I mean, she was drunk, so she probably wasn't capable of making the best decisions, but. That's true. If you realize you're lost, like, in that case, stay put. Like, the closer you stay to where you came in at, the more likely somebody might be able to find you. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't keep walking because who knows where you'll end up. Yeah. With her body being found approximately three miles away from the nearest exit, and looking at one of the only attempted exactly. maps of three this tunnel miles system, away. she never stood a chance. Whoa, yeah. dude. That's crazy. Perhaps it was dehydration or hypothermia that killed her, but according to some, based it's on the weird photo, the corpse- that like my brain doesn't have a fuck no for this situation. Like, like I look at caves with like tight squeezes and shit, right? And my brain has an immediate no. I would not go in that. I have no desire to ever try that. I yeah. would get stuck. I do not want to do that. Same. My brain doesn't have that for this catacomb. My brain has a like. It, be kind of dope. It would to, be. It would be. I mean, I know that's risky, but I would probably be as careful as I could. Like, I don't know. I have a level of confidence to feel like maybe I could draw a map and not get lost, but... Yeah. I don't know. There's something in the back of my brain that's like, I kind of want to go. <laughs> I've always kind of wanted to go to the French catacombs as well. It's well, just a weird thing. Here's the thing you need to understand about this. 1,500 miles worth. That is literally half the distance of the United of the mainland United States. I get it. It's just I, there's something about it. I don't know. I think it's the fact that I'm so into like dungeon delving games and stuff that it just kind of speaks to that weird nerdy part of my brain. You know? Eh, fair enough. But uh, like, I get it would be dangerous, but I'm just like, I, I, it wouldn't be an immediate like no, never for me. Like, I don't know. Like, especially to like you know to be honest. This is going to sound really dark, but if I'm ever diagnosed with a terminal illness, then I think it would definitely become a 100% fuck it. Oh, wow. Why not? Gonna die either way. May as well go explore a badass fucking catacomb before I die. Maybe so. If I fuck up and get lost, I was gonna die either way. Like, know what I mean? True. I know that's dark, but I'm I'm just saying. Like, I don't know. There's something about it. It's intriguing. I hear you. She never stood a chance. Perhaps it was dehydration or hypothermia that killed her. But according to some, based on the photo, the corpse appears to have its skull caved in, implying that in a desperate attempt to end her anguish, she may have bashed her head against the wall until she passed away. Oh, shit. Her name was Masha, and she was only 19 years old. Wait, how much of this story Three is long months. No, she didn't bash her head against a wall. Later in she April, was, she got murdered. Lata and his. I I wouldn't doubt it. Probably by this dude and his friends. Group would stumble across the body, immediately reporting their findings to the police. The law enforcement refused to even try and venture down there in order to retrieve her, as they knew just how dangerous and unmapped this environment was. It would take two long years for her body to be recovered, oh thanks God. to a friend of Lata writing a strongly worded letter to the government that included a photo of Masha's body. The story is unimaginable. To be trapped in a place like this with no means of escaping, it has to be the absolute worst way to go. And because of the gruesome nature of the story and the photograph, it spread all throughout the online world, where it became a legendary internet mystery. As even with the added context, many were still left with pressing questions. Were Masha's friends involved in some way with her death? Had they abandoned her there on purpose? And did Lata know more than he claimed? But as it turns out, there was one far more pressing question that needed to be answered. 
In 2015, a full later. decade after this photo was taken, a journalist named Mike Pearl had picked up the case with the hopes of writing a Halloween article for Vice. And in his research, he made a rather unusual discovery, as according to him, Masha seemingly didn't exist. Pearl was never able to find oh, any verifiable proof that a girl named Masha had ever gone Somebody missing in that Somebody writing actually he did good work? Able to find that's what I'm saying. That's more surprising than anything else that's going to be revealed here. Find any death <laughs> records of anyone by that name either, or even any reports of a body being pulled from the catacombs during this time frame. Something just wasn't adding up, and it got stranger from here. Sometime after the photograph began making its rounds, one of the most prominent explorers of the Odessa catacombs put out a statement on his own website in regards to Masha, which read, Besides the original photographer, there isn't one person, civilian or law enforcement, that can confirm the story. We believe it is just a practical joke, and the corpse is fake. Really? Following this revelation, Pearl was able to track down Mata, who was unable to recount where the body was roughly seen, or but even how to get if in If there was a strongly worded letter from the parents and the family to the government... I wonder if it was, like, Lata... Was that just someone... I think that was Lata, like, guessing it up online. Maybe. Like, if he's the only source and he can yeah. control the narrative... you would think the journalist would have been able to get a hold of some kind of proof of that. Like, well, here's talk the thing. to someone who worked at the government or something. Here's the difference. Okay, everybody, I want everybody to understand that there's a difference. There are journalists, then there are investigative journalists. Mm. Journalists look for the headlines. True. This guy's an investigative journalist from the sound. Investigative of journalists look for the truth. Mm. That's the difference. That's like, for instance, like TMZ, TMZ, they're journalists. I use that term very loosely because Harvey Lavin's a shitbird. The Boston Globe Spotlight Team, they are investigative journalists, and they and it doesn't matter how long it takes them, they will get the truth. Even if it kills them. With the other people shown in this photo, none of whom had ever come forward to back his testimony, which makes the credibility of Lata and his story of Masha incredibly shaky at best. However, this is where the crux of the mystery stands today. When looking at these photos, one thing is apparent to me and essentially everyone else who has seen them. The corpse shown seems very real, and matches the decay of the bodies found in similar environments, with that one prominent Odessa explorer eventually deleting his statement at some point over the years, leaving the general consensus that this is in fact a real corpse. But if the story of Masha isn't true, then who is this? Well, we have no idea. It's entirely a mystery. But the reality of the situation is that bodies being found down in these catacombs isn't totally uncommon. Over the years, many explorers have gotten lost down there and suffered the exact same fate as the story of Masha. But on top of this, these tunnels have also been used by murderers as a dumping ground for their victims' bodies, oh. with either one of these scenarios being possible in this case. Though the frustrating part is that we may never actually know who this person was or how they died, as I and many others have doubts that this body was ever actually recovered, just simply due to lack of public information and news reports about it. And instead, the reality is that this corpse is probably still down there somewhere and has simply been lost to time, as sections of the catacombs have been known to flood and cave in, sealing them off from the outside world forever. So for now, and potentially the rest of time, the story of Masha will remain an internet mystery. Damn. Damn. That one's definitely more intriguing than the others. Other than just, uh, fucked up. Yeah. It's September 1985. A hunter trudges through the wooded terrain of Christie Creek, Montana, on the trail of something big. He had been hunting a large black bear and managed to land a single shot, causing the animal to take off, leaving behind a trail of blood. He followed this trail all throughout the remote region before stumbling across a shallow ditch, where he would find a body. Though not the body of the bear he had just shot, and rather, the body of a woman reduced to bone. The remains were quickly sent off for forensic analysis, though very little could be determined other than the fact that she was a young woman, and that she had been murdered, as they found two bullet holes in her skull. With there being essentially no other information to go off of, a special team at the FBI started creating a composite of what this woman may have looked like. This was the result. Ugh. 
Oh, no, that music, too. I know that music. If she looked like that, I'm not so certain she was murdered. This was their first attempt at depicting Miss Jane Doe, who they would later dub Christy Crystal Creek, though it wouldn't be their last. What? The uncanniness of these depictions is undeniable. Yeah. And recently, I've fallen down this rabbit hole of disturbing police sketches and recreations. As though these can often be very helpful and do lead to legitimately good results, there are often times where they appear almost non-human. With many examples like Christie's being shared online on the FBI's website in order to enlist the public's help in identifying Valley, these victims. Dude. With one of the more notorious examples coming decades later in 2014. The discovery was made on June 5th of that year, when a group of highway workers were mowing grass in the town of Geneva, Wisconsin, when they noticed a pair of strange-smelling suitcases. Inside them were two bodies belonging to two women, both in various stages of decomposition, and both appearing to have been strangled to death. One would quickly be identified as 37-year-old Laura Simonson, while the other was in much worse shape, and distinguishing her facial features proved extremely difficult. But this didn't stop them from trying. <laughs> this is one of the more infamous examples out there due to just how unnatural it appears, with the face of this woman being turned into a meme and even being used in a video game. Oh my god, no. Yeah. Me, there's one example that I've never been able to shape, as the entire story and its recreation Jima, gives me dude. such an uneasy feeling. The discovery was made all the way back in April of 1977, when a couple in Alberta, Canada had returned to their often abandoned cabin in order to empty the septic tank, only to find a body floating inside. Oh. The body was in brutal shape and showed signs of extreme torture, as the man had been beaten, mutilated, burned with cigarettes, and even shot multiple times. And due to the condition of the body, it was impossible to identify him. Though regardless, a recreation was made, and using a computer model of the man's skull, they slowly pieced him together. He would later be dubbed Septic Tank Sam. There's something so depressing about these composites, as these are real people with real stories and real names that have been reduced to these horrifying images and tacky nicknames. But there's another side of these police sketches too, as when dealing with victims, it's obviously incredibly sad. But when dealing with suspects, these off-putting identities can be outright horrifying. Over the years, there's been numerous unidentified killers who law enforcement were not able to positively identify, forcing them to turn to these same methods of sketching and recreating with one of the darkest examples being that of the Lake Bodum killer. It was June 5th, 1960. Four Finnish teenagers were on a camping trip to Lake Bodum, sleeping peacefully in their tent. bands of all time back in high school. Children of Bodum. Named after these murders. Yep. And on the lakeshore, when suddenly they were attacked. It happened in an instant as a man yielding a knife began stabbing through the tent, eventually bludgeoning the group with an unidentified blunt object. That night, three of the teens would be killed, while one managed to survive with substantial injuries. When asked about what he had seen that night, the lone survivor claimed that the man who attacked them wore all black and had large red eyes. Based on his accounts and other potential sightings, a sketch of what this man may have looked like was made, and the results were unusual at best. Oh. With this man going on to garner the appropriate nickname of Bug Eyes McLip due to just how unnatural his facial features appear, especially his eyes. In fact, there's something unnatural about all of these recreations, which begs the question, did any of them actually work? Well, surprisingly, out of these four people, three have been identified. Wow. Christy Crystal Creek would go on to be identified as Janet Lee Lucas, a 23-year-old who would be the last identified victim of serial killer Wayne Nance, with this oh. identification being the result of improved forensic genealogy. The second and most notorious example would go on to be identified as Jenny Gomez, who had been strangled by Steven Zillich, a man dubbed the Wisconsin Suitcase Murderer. Oh, no. And despite this recreation appearing to look nothing like Jenny, it was actually the sole reason that she was identified, as one of her family members ended up recognizing these overpronounced cheekbones and matching them to Jenny. I was going to say the and eyes and teeth are kind of spot on, but it's just the, the rest of it's just so off. 
then there was septic tank Sam, who was revealed to be Gordon Edwin Sanderson. Thanks again to genetic genealogy, as a sample of his sister's DNA was eventually used to prove that this was in fact him, though it's still unknown who killed him or why. Which leaves just this final person, the killer of at least three people. He unfortunately has never been identified, and this isn't too surprising as the features of this person just seem impossible. He just looks far too strange to be real, right? Well, even though he hasn't been positively ID'd, it doesn't mean that he hasn't been potentially photographed. Shortly after the teens were murdered, a funeral was held in their remembrance, for which a large crowd of locals were in attendance, with this photo of the crowd being snapped. And standing there, in the center of it all, was a man whose features looked impossible. Exactly. This man fuck? would never be photographed again, and his connection to the case has never been officially confirmed. Wow, dude. Leaving these murders unsolved to this very day. That's heavy, dude. That's heavy, bro. God. Oof. I wonder how the guy who survived feels about the fact that a band named themselves after that incident. I don't know. Well, it's just like uh, Led Zeppelin. I mean, Led also rest in peace, Alexi Leo. Oh yeah, but Led Zeppelin. I mean, they like they named themselves after like the Graf Zeppelin, and the fact that you know the Hindenburg, one of the Zeppelins, basically collapsed or like blew up, and it was a, as a matter of fact, Led Zeppelin used that incident as one of their as like one of their album covers. Mm -hmm. And it was like only 30 years, it was like only 30 years after the incident. So how long, or when did children, let's take a look and see. When did children of Bodom, children of Bodom, there we are. So they were formed in 1993, and they were named after something that happened in 1960. So 33 years, whereas Led Zeppelin... Led Zeppelin was formed in 1968, and the Hindenburg, 1937, so 31 years. So basically, that seems to be the meta. 30 years, uh, 30 years uh, that uh, is needed to be, like, officially needed in order to uh, give a... Uh, in order to give a proper like, like time for everything to, uh, to pass in order for it to be, th for instance, I wouldn't doubt it if by by like twenty thirty one or twenty thirty two, we have a we have a, uh, we have a a band called the World Trade Raiders or something like that. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> How long has it been since 9-11? 20 days. No, fucker, not this year. Uh, it's been officially 23 years and 20 days. Yeah, I was going to say in like seven years, bands will probably be naming themselves after that. Yeah, it, that seems to be the case. It's like every 30 years. Uh, well, here's the thing. Tragedy plus time equals comedy. I hate to say it, but, you know, we joke about the Mongols and the Black Plague and, uh, you know, uh, and like, all these other things, but... I think there's certain events you probably couldn't get away with naming yourself after, though. What's that? Like, I don't think you should probably name yourself, like, after, like, the Holocaust <laughs> or something. Mm. Then again, there is a band, or there's a movie called Cannibal Holocaust, but it's not the same Yeah, Holocaust I think that they're referring to. I was going to say, uh... Uh, they, I think there is one called. Uh, I think there was a band called uh, Trebling, uh, Trebling, uh, Treblinka Cleanup Crew. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, the second largest, like, uh, assa like, like, the second largest extermination camp. Uh, but yeah, thirty years. And like, there's the Black Dahlia Murder. Like, yeah, one of my favorite bands of all time as well. It's weird. Two of my favorite bands of all time are named after murders. Uh, the Black Dahlia. There she is. Elizabeth Short. 
And that was in 1947. And the Black Dahlia Murderer. Is from 2001. So, yeah, way, like... A lot of more than enough time. Also, rest in peace to uh, Trevor. Trevor, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Here's the thing: if you uh, found a band and name it after a murder, you may die young if you're the vocalist. Yeah, that's true. So. Well, for Led Zeppelin, though, it was John Bonham, the drummer, who who died young. So, I don't know. Well, it was a, well that was more of a tragedy. That was more of a tragedy and not like a malicious murder or anything like that. Yeah. It's uh, more of like a disaster. Yeah. Well, all right. Anyway, I don't really have anything else to add to this. We've been on this video for almost an hour, so I want to end it here. So, everyone, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, if you all enjoyed what you saw here, uh, feel free to let us know and... Uh, if you want to see more from Nick Crowley, be sure to click his name in the title of the video. And until next time, signing off, I am Nate. I am Nick. Y'all be good people. Take care. Peace.